Amen, amen. So if you would turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6. We're continuing on in Hebrews. We're in chapter 6 now. And we're going to read verses 1 through 12. That's a big section and a very controversy. We're about to enter. We're not going to talk about it this week. We're, we're going to talk about it next week. One of the most controversial passages in all of Scripture. Very difficult passage in Scripture. We're going to talk about next week. But I want to read through the whole section today because the, the whole section really is it within its context. So we're going to teach through verses 1 through 3 today, and then verses 4 through 12 next week. But I want to read it all. So Hebrews chapter 6, starting in verse 1, and we're going to go all the way through verse 12, and then today we're just going to talk about verses 1 through 3. So follow along with me in your version. This is the New American Standard Bible. Hebrews chapter 6, starting in verse 1, says, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance, from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands, and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For in the case of those who have been enlightened, once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. For ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed and it ends up being burned. Verse nine, but beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So this is a passage of 12 verses continuing on from chapter five. And then we're gonna just go through verses one through three today and then continue on next week, verse, hopefully, God willing, if God permits, verses four through 12. So look with me, verses one through three again. Kind of the, the picture here is grow up, basically is what the writer is saying, is grow up. He's continuing on from what we talked about last week at the end of chapter five, where we talked about being a person, a, a believer who leaves milk, spiritual milk, and moves on to solid food, and then he continues on here. He says, therefore, after talking about verses 11 through 14 in chapter five, he says, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity. Let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands, and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. So what things were they to grow up in? What things were they to, to grow in? What are the elementary teachings about Christ that they are to leave behind? These elementary teachings about Jesus. David Gussick says, these are all things that an Orthodox Jew could perform without ever knowing Christ or becoming a Christian, these six things that are listed. And if you remember the audience, the audience of Hebrews of this letter, they're, they're Jewish. Not many Gentiles in this crowd that maybe read this letter or heard it read, heard it preached. And if you remember last week, we talked about in depth about the unbelieving Jew who would have been in that audience and then the wavering Jew who would have been in that audience, wavering in their faith, some kind of an experience with Christ, but they were tempted to go back to Judaism and then you would have a solid believer, solid believing Jew. So that's the audience. So Gussick says, these are all things, this, this list are all things an Orthodox Jew could perform without ever knowing Jesus, without ever becoming a Christian. So the writer has established at the end of chapter five, 
that the new covenant in Christ is superior to the old covenant. That's a theme that we've seen in Hebrews, this idea of Jesus being superior and supreme to the things of the Old Testament. So the writer's continuing on here that the new covenant is superior to the old covenant. The old covenant was just a type of what was to come. It was a picture of what was real and what was to come, which is found in Christ. And then in in verses 11 through 14 of chapter five, he addresses them in the first person. He says, you, you need to move on from milk and grow to solid food. But now here we transition in chapter six. Now he identifies with them and he says, let us, let us move on to maturity. He's saying, I am with you in this. Let us move on to maturity and build on this foundation. So the writer is continuing to declare that we are to move on from the elementary teachings about Christ. Move on. What are these elementary teachings about Christ? Are these somehow bad? Is the elementary teachings about Jesus somehow bad? Because he's saying we need to move on. We need to leave those behind and move forward. Are they they somehow bad? Well, of course they aren't. They're the foundation of our Christian faith. The elementary principles about Jesus are the foundation of our faith. We move on from that. We build on that. But they are basic, just like we talked about last week. They are milk. They're not solid food. We can't live on milk. We can only live as we grow on solid food. We can't stay on milk. We can't stay immature. And this is what the writer is continuing on here when he says, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ Let us press on to maturity. Let's move forward. That's what he's saying. Let us all move forward. So just like the ABCs, as a a child, the ABCs are foundational to what? To learning how to write and learning how to read. The ABCs, simple arithmetic, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, simple arithmetic is foundational to upper levels of math. If our teachers, every single year that we started school, went back to the basics of the ABCs and basic arithmetic, we would never get anywhere. Your calculus teacher didn't say, okay, we got we to go back to, to kindergarten and first grade, and we're going we're gonna to go over one plus one equals what? Two. No. Your English teacher didn't go back and say, okay, we've got to go through the ABCs. So we're teaching our children, Jude and and Adela, they're learning the ABCs. They can say them, the ABCs and the one, two, threes. But the teacher doesn't go back to those. Those are foundational to knowing the things of a mature person, but the teacher doesn't always go back to that. The foundation's been set. So this is what the writer's saying. We don't need to go back to the foundation. We actually need to build on the foundation. We need to build on the foundation. We need to build, as a solid believer, we need to build on the foundation, the elementary teachings of Christ, the basic foundation of Jesus and what he's done and who he is and his word. How are we gonna grow in intimacy with Christ unless we know the foundations, but if we only stay on the foundations, we're not gonna grow in our intimacy with him. We will stay babies. One of the pillars of the anchor, the vision of the anchor is to have intimacy with God. Well, in order to have intimacy with God, we have to leave the elementary basics and move forward in our maturity to really know Jesus, to to grow in our intimacy. It only happens when we build on the basic foundation of our faith. So this passage is about moving forward and maturing in this process of sanctification. We've talked about that a lot in here, this idea of sanctification, being set apart, continually being made holy for Christ and for God and for his usefulness. They were continually being sanctified. They were not laying again a foundation of basic Christianity. We don't just continually go to basic Christianity, basic Christianity. No, we move forward in maturity. And we talked about this a lot last week and and in previous weeks. So in the original text of the Bible, there is no break between the end of chapter five, which is verse 14, and chapter six, verse one. There's not a, you know, we see chapter break and we think, okay, it's a whole new, new thought and book and everything. No, it's a continuation. He's going, that's why he says, therefore. 
He's saying all the stuff that I've laid before, you need to move from baby food, from spiritual milk onto solid food. You need to mature. And he says, therefore, let us leave behind these elementary teachings of Christ and move on to maturity. So this is the, the backdrop here. This is the idea. So the writer is calling his readers to three main things here. That we are to build upon the foundation, we're to build upon the foundation of repentance and faith. They're together. Build upon the foundation of washings and laying on of hands and build upon the foundation of the resurrection and judgment. Let me read a, a passage here where Jesus talks about building. Building on a solid foundation found in Luke chapter six. This is what Jesus says. He says, and why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words. So everyone who comes to me and they, they hear me speaking. They hear my words and they act upon them. I will show him who he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation upon the rock. And when a flood rose, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been built well. But the one who has heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house upon the ground without any foundation and the torrent burst against it and immediately it collapsed and the rain of that the ruin of that house was great. So building upon a foundation, that's what the writer's talking about here in this passage in Hebrews chapter six, verses one through three, is building on the foundation of the elementary teachings of Christ. So what are these? What are these elementary teachings? So a builder, literally a builder, you know builders probably, or you've, you've maybe seen a house built. They lay a foundation. Once they lay the foundation of concrete and they let it cure, they what? They begin to build a house upon it. They don't come back after that foundation has been cured and lay another foundation and then let that cure. And then they come back the next week and they look and they go, let's lay another foundation. That would be absurd. They then have to, they lay a foundation. Why? So that they can build a house and so that the house will stand on solid ground and that house will be the very purpose of why that foundation was laid, to live in, to use. That's the foundation. So that's the idea here, laying a foundation. The, lay, the foundation's been laid. Now let's build the house. Let's move on. Let's move on. So do you get the picture here? The writer's explaining this as it pertains to our Christian faith, that we are to build a house. We move forward. We move on. So the way I'm going to break this up, this build upon the foundation of repentance and faith and uh, washings and laying on of hands and resurrection and the judgment, I'm going to compare the Jewish perspective or what the, the Orthodox Jew might have been thinking at this time, because those are the readers of this letter. And then what is the Christian perspective? So on each of these things, that's what we're going to talk about. This is how the Jews laid a foundation, and this is how Christians are to build on that foundation. All right? So number one is build upon the foundation of repentance and faith. This is verse one. The first, uh, second part of it says, let us press on to maturity, right? Let us press on to maturity, not laying again, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So what was Jewish repentance? Jewish repentance, which is the elementary teachings of Christ, or for the non-believing Jew, they would have been believing this. This is Jewish repentance, okay? They repented, but their repentance was of dead works. There was no redemption in Jewish, Orthodox Jewish repentance. There was no redemption in that. No redemption in their works. So what are these dead works that the writer's talking about, that they repented from these dead works? Brooke Westcott, he refers to it being the Levitical system and the law that was incapable of producing spiritual life. So, so he would say, Westcott says, that the dead works was the Levitical system and the law, that they were unable to produce a spiritual life. Herschel Hobbes, he says, since the New Testament speaks of men outside of Christ being dead in their sin, then their works are dead as well. So he says that these dead works are dead because they are apart from Christ. The Orthodox Jew would have done good works and lived by the law, but they're dead works because they're apart from Christ. And then William Barclay, he breaks it up into three different ways. He says that these dead works could be the works of just unrighteousness, sin that leads to death. Dead works, sin that leads to death. Could be uh, 
defiling deeds that the Jews literally defiled themselves if they were to touch a dead body. So they were not allowed to touch a dead body. That might be the dead works. Or the third one, he says that they could mean not doing the traditional religious things that a good Jew would do. So not doing the things that they should do could be the dead works. So that's Jewish repentance, Jewish repentance. But Christian repentance is true redemption. You see, we are to, the writer is saying that we need to build upon the foundation of repentance and faith. We need to build on that foundation, but it's Christian repentance. It's true redemption. This is how Jesus started out his ministry. He said, repent and believe the gospel. When he started his public ministry, can you imagine these were the first words of Jesus? The first words of Jesus were not, hey, I love you and my grace is sufficient for you. That's not how Jesus starts out his ministry. He starts out his ministry by saying, repent and believe the good news. Turn, this is Christian repentance. John the Baptist, he did the same thing. He paved the way for Jesus. This is Jesus' cousin. He paved the way and it was a way of repentance. He said, repent from your dead works, repent. And then Jesus comes on the scene and he says the same thing, repent, repent. This is Christian repentance. In his book, I Surrender, Patrick Morley, he writes, the church's integrity problem, do we have an integrity problem in the church, in America especially? Yes, we do, we have an integrity problem. The church's integrity problem is in the misconception that we can add Christ to our lives, but not subtract sin. It's a change in belief without a change in behavior. And Morley goes on to say, it is revival without reformation, without repentance. There has to be repentance in the Christian church to follow Christ. This is true repentance. Dr. Burkhoff, in his systematic theology book, he says, true repentance never exists except in conjunction with faith. And this is what the writer of Hebrew combines. He says, repentance from dead works and faith toward God, combines them. So Burkhoff says, true repentance never exists except in conjunction with faith. While on the other hand, wherever there is true faith, there is also real repentance. They go hand in hand. The two are but different aspects of the same turning, a turning away from sin in the, in the direction of God. The two cannot be separated. They are simply complementary parts of the same process. So what is repentance? It's going one direction and then all of a sudden doing a U-turn. That's what repentance is. It's going one way and all of a sudden putting on the brakes and doing a U-turn. That is Christian repentance. Biblical repentance is literally making up your mind once and for all that I'm going to turn from this and I'm gonna go towards God. I'm gonna turn from myself, whatever it might be. I'm gonna turn from that and I'm gonna go towards Jesus. That is biblical repentance, making up our mind. Is your way better or is Jesus' way better? This is repentance, making up your mind. And then Jewish, Jewish faith in God. So he talks about Jewish repentance, Christian repentance. Now Jewish faith and Christian faith. So Jewish faith in God. Well, Jews were zealous for God. Jews of the Bible were zealous for God. They loved God deeply, so deeply. They believed in him but their faith was elementary. Why? Because it put its trust in the law of God and in the traditions of man, not in the eventual promised son of God and savior and his final work on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. So though they had great faith in God, they had no faith in his son. So that's just elementary, foundational, but elementary. So what is Christian faith in God? Well, faith in Christ is the foundation of, and the building. It's the foundation, faith in Christ, and it's the building that goes above it. All growth starts and is accomplished with faith in Christ. For by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. By grace through faith. Ephesians 6, above all, taking on the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the devil, of the wicked. First Corinthians, be watchful, stand firm in the faith. 
stand firm in faith, act like men, be strong. 2 Corinthians 5, so we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Later on in Hebrews chapter 11, it says, it is impossible to please God without faith. It is impossible to please God without faith. Faith is believing and faith is trusting. This is what faith is. Believing, how does believing start? It starts with our mind and then it's transferred to our heart and then it's transferred from there to the members of our body to action. So if it starts in our mind, we are to believe in God with our intellect. This isn't some blind leap of faith where we jump off a cliff and we say, oh God, if you can save me, you will. No, it's intellectual in nature. It's intellectual. How is it intellectual? Well, how do we know that the Bible is true? How do we know that it's reliable? How do we know that God is the one true God, that it's not multiple gods and you serve your God and I'll serve my God? Know that there is one true God. How do we know that? We use our mind. How do we know that Jesus was real? Can we do enough study to say, yeah, this guy was a real guy. He's not some guy that floats in the sky with some halo around him. No, he was a real man. How do we prove that the resurrection is a historical event? We do it with our mind. It's true. These, these are the things that are concerning our mind. So faith is believing that starts with our mind, and then faith is believing that goes to our heart. The makeup of the heart in, in Jewish custom was not the muscle that pumps the blood. It's referred to that sometimes, but most often the heart is referred to as our mind our will, our emotions, and our desires. That's our heart. Our mind, what do we set our mind on? What is our heart set on? What are our emotions set on? What are our desires set on? Do I love God with all my heart? Do I love him with my heart? And then belief of God is proven by the action of our bodies, by the action of our hands, and by the action of our feet. That's how we prove that we have faith, that we believe. The word believe in the New Testament comes with this idea idea of being active, not static. It's an idea of active faith. What does James say? Faith without works is dead. He says, I'll show you my faith by my works, by my actions. So you see, it's with our mind, it's with our heart, and it's with our actions. That's how we believe. That's what faith is. Faith is believing. And then faith is also trusting. So what is trusting? How do we trust? very similar, a lot of crossover here. Trusting is believing and having faith in God. We, we trust in his love for us. Trust in God's love for you. Trust that he loves you. Trust in his protection of you. Trust that he protects you, that he's your protector. And trust in his provision for you. When I was thinking about trusting in his provision for us, it just made me think about the month of June and the month of July for the Van Gundy family. Like we have seen the Lord show up in provision for us over the last five weeks. Like out of nowhere, where we had something come up that was gonna cost a certain amount of money, like literally God gave us the exact amount of money. It happened like three times over the past five weeks. And I'm not a health and wealth kind of guy, a name it, claim it kind of guy, but I've seen God, we have trusted God with our provision and I've seen God come through. It's amazing. And that doesn't happen a lot in a sense of like where something cost something that we didn't know that broke down and then all of a sudden the Lord just showed up and gave us like almost the same amount. That's happened like three times over the last five weeks for us. We've seen God provide for us. Amazing, amazing because we're trusting in his provision. So you are to trust in his provision. This is what it means to have faith in God and to believe. So repentance and faith, they are foundations for Christianity, they are the foundation, but we need not lay this foundation again. We don't have to continue lay the foundation of repentance and faith in a sense that, that when you were a kid and you went to VBS or you went to Awana <coughs> and they gave an altar call, the pastor or the teacher said, anybody who would like to receive Christ into their heart, please come forward and you come forward every single week And every single uh, uh, mission top experience, mountaintop experience, every single camp, and every single conference, and every single uh, crusade, whatever it might be, 
We don't have to lay again that foundation. That foundation's been laid. If you have, if you have come to know Christ as your Lord and your Savior, that is sealed. That is sealed by the Holy Spirit. You don't have to continue doing it. You don't have to continue doing it. And that's what the writer's saying. But you don't have to continue building on repentance and faith in a sense that you don't have to continue going back to the elementary teaching then day one. No, that's been set. When God tugs on your heart, but you already know Christ and you have surrendered your life to Christ and you know you know him, you don't have to come to an altar call or have some mountaintop experience like that. However, there is a repentance and a faith that continues. Because when Jesus says repent and believe the gospel, that word repent is in the present tense. It means continue, continue repenting. Continue. So there is a repentance and a faith that continues, but it is building on the foundation of that first repentance and that first faith in coming to Christ. We build upon that. We build upon that. We continue repenting. What? As a follower of Christ. As I continue on in my journey of sanctification, knowing Jesus, I repent from my sin. I continue turning away from it. My faith forever grows. Our trust forever increases, built on the first time that I ever believed. First time that you ever believed. John Calvin said, as in building a house, one must never leave the foundation. Yet to be always laboring in laying the foundation would be ridiculous. Yes, would it not? We don't continually lay that foundation of repentance and faith in a sense that we continually give our lives to Christ. No, when we've surrendered to Jesus and he has saved us, he saved us once and for all. But we build upon that in our faith and in our repentance. And then number two, we build upon the foundation of washings and laying on of hands. This is verse two, the first part of Hebrews chapter six says, let us press on to maturity. And I inserted this because this is what the writer's saying, not laying again a foundation of instruction about washings. The KJV and the NIV, they say baptism. They use the word baptism here. They say, not laying again a foundation of instruction about washings and laying on of hands. So the word for washings here is the word baptismos, which equals washings. Okay, and we'll talk about what the Christian word baptism is. But the, the word here for washings means, is, is the Greek word baptismos, which literally means washings. So Jewish washing was a washing of the body or a washing of utensils, a washing of the hands in order to purify themselves. So when Jesus turns the water into wine, you know this story in the Gospel of John chapter two, talks about uh, Jesus' first miracle and first sign, and John, one of Jesus' best friends, he records this story, and he talks about Jesus turning the water into wine, and what kind of wine did he turn it into? He didn't turn it into just uh, the Boone's Farm kind of wine, okay, the, the Circle K kind of wine. No, he turned it into, and I might say this wrong, I'm not a wine drinker, a nice Cabernet Sauvignon. Oh, is that pretty good? Right? He turns it into the best wine. This is a miracle. Now, the miracle is not in the fact that Jesus turns water into wine, as amazing as that is, okay? Because the, the writer of the Gospel of John uses a certain word to describe, unlike the other Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, called the Synoptic Gospels, when they use the word for a miracle that Jesus performed, they use the word miracle, all right? John doesn't use the word miracle. He uses the word signs, so what he's saying is there's a deeper meaning behind the actual miracle. There's a sign. There's seven signs in the Gospel of John. And this is the first of the signs, turning water into wine. Well, what's the sign that the writer is trying to get to, that John's trying to tell us, trying to tell his, his readers? The sign is that Jesus took the purification pots, so there would be these big jars that held a lot of water in them at the entrance of someone's home. So when an Orthodox Jew would walk through the doors in order to get rid of the defilement of the world because they were, they were interacting with Gentiles and so they didn't want to be defiled. So because of that interaction, they would come into their home and they would take these purification pots and they would get the water. They might have a slave that does this or they do it themselves. They would get the water out of these, these pots. They would cleanse themselves, sometimes from head to toe, and then continue on into their home so that they wouldn't defile the rest of their home. These are the purification pots. Well, John is saying that Jesus took the nasty foot washing water that was used for purification and he turned it into wine and not just the best wine, not just wine, but the absolute best wine. But that's what Jesus did. This is his sign. 
And what was the sign he's telling the Jews that Jesus takes what's nasty and what you think is gonna cleanse you and he turns it into the best. And it says that he not only filled up those, those pots, uh, you know, halfway or three quarters, it says, filled it to the brim with the best wine, with the best wine. So the Jews had this idea of washing. That's what, they're, that's what the writer's saying. Let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of instruction about washing. It's just because you wash yourself when you come into the door, is that really cleaning you from your sin? No, it's not. Another example is the washing of the hands. They would wash their hands. In Matthew chapter 15, it says, then some of the Pharisees and the scribes came to Jesus from Jer- Jerusalem and said, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders, speaking about Jewish elders, for they do not wash their hands when they eat bread? And after Jesus called the crowd to him, he said to them, hear and understand, it's not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth that defiles him. And Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. Jesus said, are you still lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and then it's eliminated? But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands doesn't defile a man. Jesus is taking the foundation of washings and taking it a step further and saying, it's not about washing your hands before you eat. You guys missed it. You see? So washing of these things did not purify them. And it still does not purify them today. If you have any Jewish friends and you know how particular, if they're Orthodox Jews, how particular they are about their utensils and not putting this one and this one and all that, does that really mean anything in the, the spirit of God? No, and that's what the writer's saying. Move on from this, Jewish person. You need to move on from this. Move on from this, all right? So what is Christian baptism? What is this Christian washing? So the word for Christian baptism is baptizo. So baptismos is washings. So if you're reading in the NIV or the KJV, you might read the word baptism, and you're like, what's going on? Well, it's the word washings, but then Christian baptism, the writer would use the word baptizo, which it's used for the word for immersion. It's used for baptism, Christian baptism. So does Christian baptism save us? No, Christian baptism does not save us or literally purify us. No, it doesn't. It's a symbol, but it's moving on. It's building on the foundation of the old covenant and it's moving on. So a person who comes to know Christ, should they get baptized? Absolutely. Why would a person who comes to know Jesus, not be baptized. It makes no sense. And what's the picture? The picture of Christian baptism literally is getting a person because the word means immerse. You take a person who has professed Christ and they have said, hey, come to my baptism. Or I wanna be baptized. They bring people around, maybe a group like this, maybe friends from work, whatever, and they say, I want you to come to my baptism. Why do we be baptized? Because we are professing Christ. Jesus was baptized, and Jesus commands us to be baptized. Baptism is a picture of a person who is standing there. It's a picture of the cross. What happened to Jesus on the cross? He's hanging on the cross, and after he dies, he is buried. When he's buried, three days later, Jesus raises from the dead. That's a picture of Christian baptism. That's why it's by immersion. So you take a person who has professed Christ, and they say, I want everybody to know that I am not ashamed of Jesus. Christian baptism is taking that person and they're standing in the water and they're saying, this is my old life. I have died. I have died. So they're dunked, completely immersed in the water and then they come up and they have risen anew. This is the picture of Christian baptism. This is why we're baptized. We're telling people, I am new. I am new and I want you to know it, that I am not ashamed of Jesus and I follow Jesus. This is the picture of baptism. So you have the Jewish washing and then you have this Christian baptism. And then he goes on and Jewish laying on of hands and Christian laying on of hands. So what is this Jewish laying on of hands? Well, there were two significances of laying on of hands in the Jewish tradition. One would be a transfer of guilt. If you remember the scapegoat, once a year, Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, the high priest would then 
pray the sins, the guilt of the nation Israel and his own sin over this scapegoat, and then they would send it off to take the sins away. So it's a, it's a picture of laying on of hands to get rid of the sin. And then a second one would be a transfer of blessing. So you have Abraham blessing Isaac and Isaac blessing Jacob and so on and so forth. This idea of laying on of hands to give a blessing. This is the picture of Jewish laying on of hands. Well, what is Christian laying on of hands? Well, we see Jesus. He laid hands on people. Why? To heal them. And he healed them. The apostle, they laid hands on people and they healed them. James, he said, call the elders of the church so that we can lay hands on the sick so that they would be healed. So the foundation of baptism was to be built upon as more than just a cleansing, more than just a cleansing or a washing, but the mature baptism was found in a profession of Christ. And then the foundation of laying on of hands was built upon something that was only accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can heal someone. Only the Holy Spirit. No one in here, if you say, well, I have the gift of healing, you've misunderstood what that gift is. God gives that gift temporarily to followers of Christ to heal somebody for sure. That exists today. But make no mistake about it, it's not that I have the gift of healing. That's a misinterpretation of scripture. Because if you have the gift of healing, please tell me, and after service, we will walk over to Providence and heal everybody in the hospital. Please, let's go do that. Let's go just lay hands on every single bed in that place and get people to walk out of there. No, that's a misinterpretation of the gift of healings. It's a gift that God uses a person, but it's God that heals. God is the one that heals through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the the building of the foundation that moves on from the Jewish tradition. And then the final one here is build upon the foundation of the resurrection and judgment. The second part of verse two of Hebrews six says, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Well, what the heck is he talking about here? Well, these two foundations have to do with eschatology, the end times, the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. Eschatology, it's the end times. So what was the Jewish view of the resurrection? Well, the Pharisees, two types of people. You had the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees, they believed in the resurrection. They would take Isaiah 26, 19 and Daniel 12, 2. They take it seriously. It says this, thy dead shall live. My dead body shall arise, awake and sing. Ye that dwell in the dust, for thy dew is as of the dew of light and the earth shall bring to life the shades and and the second says this in Daniel and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to reproaches and everlasting abhorrence so the Pharisees the, the orthodox Jew who was a Pharisee believed in the resurrection a Sadducee did not believe in that why the Sadducees believed only in the Torah which is the first five books of the Bible it's the law of Moses Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The Sadducees only believed in that, and there's not a lot of talk about the resurrection and eternal judgment in there. It talks about how to live. So they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe that the rest of Scripture was authoritative as the Torah was. So what's the Christian view of the resurrection of the dead? What's well, made possible because of the resurrection of Christ? That's what we believe. Christian resurrection is only made possible because Jesus raised from the dead. We believe, we believe that Phil's, he's back there, that Phil's grandfather and grandmother, because they were followers of Jesus, that they will be resurrected. To be absent from the body is to be present with Christ right now for them. But when the resurrection happens of the dead, they will arise. Those who have followed Christ, they will have a resurrection body. We believe that because of Jesus. He had a resurrection body, and it's only made possible. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and Paul talks about this. He talks about the resurrection. So this is the, the Christian view of resurrection as opposed to just the, view, the Jewish view of resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 12. This whole chapter is about the resurrection. It's the gospel. But I want to just uh, read a few verses here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12 says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, 
how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. And then look at verse 40. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one and the glory of the earthly is another. And then skip down to verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable perishable body, that's our physical body, but it's raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, this is our perishable body, but it's raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So this is a picture of Christian resurrection, that there will be a resurrection of the dead. And then moving on to eternal judgment, the Jewish view of eternal judgment. So I did a little bit of digging here, and I have to admit, I'm obviously not a Jewish scholar by any stretch of the imagination. So I went to Judaism 101, literally, Judaism 101 on, on jewfact.org, okay? So the Jewish view of eternal judgment. So here are four points that they make. Judaism believes in an afterlife, but has little dogma about it. Dogma means that they're not like solid about it. They don't say, well, this is the way it is. They're just kind of loose on it. So Judaism believes in an afterlife, but has little dogma about it. The Jewish afterlife is called Olam Haba, which is the world to come. And then the resurrection and reincarnation are within the range of traditional Jewish belief. And then fourthly, it says temporary but not eternal punishment after death is within traditional belief. So Jewish view of eternal judgment is that there is a temporary punishment, but not eternal after death. So basically, Orthodox Judaism does not believe in hell. Taught today, according to Judaism 101. Well, what is the Christian view of eternal judgment? The foundation, remember, the writer of Hebrews is building on the foundation of the elementary teachings of Christ, saying we must leave those and move on. Those are foundational, but we're gonna move on. So what is the Christian view of eternal judgment? Matthew 13, this is what Jesus says. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and they will take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25, but when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, Then he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate from one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. The goats, those who are damned in eternal damnation apart from Christ, apart from God and those on his right who will be in eternity with God forever in what we call heaven. This is the Christian view. Peter says, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Every human being from every tribe, from every nation, from every tongue, from every country across the entire globe will give an account to him who is ready to judge. And then Revelation 20 says this, then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, this is the dead, resurrection, the dead, the great, and the small standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. This is the Christian view of eternal judgment, that there will be an eternal judgment. So moving on from the foundation of an eternal judgment, right, that's not too dogmatic, we're moving on from the Jewish viewpoint of eternal judgment that's not very dogmatic to one that is trusting the Bible and trusting in Jesus that there will be an eternal judgment 
for all peoples and all nations and that we will live for that day, that that day is coming, that we will all give an account for our deeds. So this entire passage of Hebrews chapter six, one through three, one through three, it's the idea of calling us and moving us into maturity, building on the solid foundation, which is Christ and his elementary teachings, the basics, basics of Christianity, and building upon that, that we move on. This is sanctification. We can't stay kids forever, right? We can't stay kids forever. Do not stay in your house forever. Your parents want you out, right? We have to leave the house and eventually be on our own. We have to build on that foundation. We quit doing the old things that we used to do and we start doing things that a mature person is supposed to do. The picture of being sanctified, solid food versus milk. This is maturity. This is building on the foundation that was laid at the beginning of your faith and my faith. And verse three of Hebrews, it says, all this that we will do under the banner of God's sovereignty. Under the banner of God's sovereignty, what does that verse say? It says in uh, verse one, he says at the end, excuse me, verse three of chapter, chapter six, it says, and this we will do only if what? If God permits. So if God permits, we will do this. This means that God is sovereign. God is the one who is in control. He is in control of everything that we talked about. God is sovereign. It's under the banner of God's sovereignty. So I want you to ask yourself this morning, ask yourself this, when you're thinking about maturity and immaturity and baby food and solid food and moving on from elementary teachings onto something that is, that is uh, more, more uh, mature, in what areas, in what areas in your own life, in what areas do you need to mature in your faith? What areas do you need to mature? Is it, is it in the basics of spiritual disciplines that you need to mature? Is it the basics? Is it, is it in worship, personal worship, and interpersonal worship, being together, and personal worship of Jesus? Is that where you need to grow? Is that a spiritual discipline where you need to mature? Is it in your prayer life, your personal prayer life? Do you need to grow in your personal prayer life as a spiritual discipline to move from baby food unto solid food, to move from elementary to, to something that is built on a foundation? Is it our prayer life? Is it interpersonal prayer life? Is it being able to pray corporately together? Is it regularly reading your Bible, reading the word regularly? I know we talk about this all the time, but that's it. How can we grow if we just stick to the ABCs? We're never gonna be able to grow. We have to be able to get into the word regularly, read the word. I'm not gonna tell you that you gotta do it at 6 a.m., but you gotta do it daily. You gotta be in the word all the time. Let the word saturate your life that it's food for your soul. In the spiritual discipline of fasting, just setting a time apart from whatever it might be, whether it's food, whether it's technology, whatever it might be, setting a time aside to fast so that you can spend time with Jesus, spend time with the Lord. Uh, spiritual discipline of learning, just having a heart to learn. I wanna learn, I wanna grow. Is this a place where you need to grow? And then proclaiming Jesus, sharing your testimony. Is this a spiritual discipline where you need to grow, where you need to mature? What if you came to Jesus? What if you were able to go up to Jesus and you were to say to Jesus, hey, Jesus, what are the two things that I need to do? Like, just give me two. I can't do much more than that. Tell me two things that I need to do. And what if he responded by saying, well, I want you to love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. That's the first thing I want you to do. And the second thing I want you to do is I want you to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love others as you love yourself. What if you went up to Jesus and you asked him that? What would be the response? How would you respond to him saying that to you? Do we do that? If Jesus lived with you for one week, if Jesus were in your house for one week, one week of your life, what would he see? What would he see in your life? What would he say to you? What would he say, uh, where would he say you need to grow? Hey, you need to grow up in this area. Here's an area that I see in your life you need to go. Here's an area that I see that you need to mature. I see this in your life. I need you to mature here. Or you need to cut out several things. There's a lot of things you're doing that you need to cut out of your life. Jesus says, look, cut these out of your life. These are taking you away from maturity. These are taking you away from a solid foundation. And build the foundation this way. You need to replace some of those things with these things, these things that Jesus says uh, are about him. You need to replace the things that are taking you away from Jesus and put these in the place. What would Jesus 
see if he were with you for one week. Because we're all looking, all of us in here, we're all looking for approval from someone, all of us. We're all looking for approval from someone. Whether it's our children are looking for approval from their parents or approval from peers, or whether you're a young adult and you're still caught in between, you want to, to have your parents tell you how proud they are of you, tell your peers how proud they are of you and how good you are, whether you're a, a, maybe an older adult and you're still looking for approval. We're all looking for approval. Would Jesus approve? We're all looking for approval. Would Jesus look at your life and say, I approve? Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. If Jesus were to look, does he approve of your life and of my life? Are you in reverse or neutral or in drive? Reverse, just turn away, turning away from God and the things of God. Or in neutral, just coasting. Man, I'm just waiting to ride this wave out till I can go home and be with Jesus. Or are you in drive? We talked about it last week, moving forward having a big view of God. I have a big view of God, not a small view of God, but I have a big view of God that says, your kingdom come on earth. I wanna be a part of that plan. Is that your view? Are you driving forward this morning? So Jesus is saying to us, stop going backwards. Stop going backwards, first of all, just stop doing that. Move away from that, turn from that, repent from that. And then don't think that neutral is is a safe place to be. Might as well be going backwards, but move forward. Start moving forward, mature. Put a stake in the ground today, right now. A stake in the ground that today is the day that I'm making a decision that I'm moving forward for Christ. I'm moving forward for Jesus. Jesus, I am moving forward to maturity today that you can declare that. Declare that to him today. Declare that as we we take communion and we remember Jesus and we remember what he's done for us and, and we reflect and we examine, we ask God, we ask right now, We ask, Holy Spirit, would you examine my heart today? Would you examine me? Would you examine me? And as you examine me, Jesus, would you bring to mind things that that are all this, that I've turned away from you, that I'm not maturing in? Would you bring that to my mind, Lord? And I'm gonna put a stake in the ground this morning. Before I ever even go and I take communion, I'm gonna put a stake in the ground. I'm gonna say, I'm moving forward. I'm tired of being in neutral. I'm tired of being in reverse. I'm moving forward towards Jesus once and for all. And for some of you, maybe that's the first time that Jesus is tugging on your heart right now to say, hey, repent and believe the gospel. Turn to me. I am the only one that's gonna satisfy. No one else is gonna satisfy. All the things that you've been chasing, you know they have not satisfied, so turn to me. And for most of us, it's just to say, I'm done. I wanna mature. I'm moving forward. I'm moving forward in my walk with Christ. I'm not gonna sit and just ride the fence and just coast, but I wanna be a kingdom impactor. I wanna make a difference for Jesus today. I'm moving forward. So would you take the time before communion to do that as you remember Jesus and what he did for you and what he did for me and then to ask him just to examine your heart and you say, Holy Spirit, examine me and know me, know me and then lead me, lead me. Let's pray. Father, we do ask you that you would by your Holy Spirit, by the power of your spirit, not by any, any human words that are spoken, but only by your spirit and the teaching of your spirit into each individual's heart, would you move us into maturity? Maybe putting a stake in that ground for the first time today, that you would move us into maturity, that we would have a self-reflection, even, even while, while Juice and Wes and, and Caitlin play a, a song, that we would sit in our chairs and we would have this reflection that would cause us to say, Jesus, I wanna move forward. Before I even go up to take communion, I wanna move forward. I wanna examine my life. I'm inviting you, Jesus, to examine me. So please examine me, Father. And I pray that each of us in here would move in obedience to that. Move in obedience to the Spirit's calling and not to just what we want. But we'd move in obedience. We'd have the courage. God, give us the courage to do that today. In Jesus' name, amen.